Since I was about five years old, I used to always question who we are as humans, where we've come from, and where we're going. I remember asking my mom all sorts of questions about where humans and gods came from, and reading books about ancient civilizations almost my whole entire life. It's just something that has been around with me forever. It's a strong sense to learn about the truth, about our origins and the meaning of life. As the years went by, from a young boy to a teenager, this urge turned into a calling. A calling to go and discover ancient civilizations and their histories. There is scientific evidence of so many things around us that the ancients, who lived thousands of years ago, used lost technology to build such magnificent things around the world, such as the pyramids, or ancient bridges, or temples, or cities, and other structures. There's even proof of ancient machinery and an understanding of the manipulation of energy. Could there have been an advanced race of beings before humans, here on Earth? Well, it's questions like that, and questions that make you question even more about who we are and where we came from, and most of all, what does it all mean? And it's that calling that led me to go and discover an ancient submerged city off the coast of India. The city is called Dwarka. Now, along my journey in learning about this long lost civilization, I emailed every person I could find associated with the excavations and the archeological digs that they did many, many years ago. Something interesting started happening. I realized that I couldn't get a single lead to follow up with me. I couldn't get a single person to answer any calls, return emails, or give me more information. In fact, I received one email stating that they could not work on the Dwarka project or any of my emails under any preconceived notion. And that's just crazy. Take a look at this image. That's when I started wondering, what are they trying to hide? And so I decided to dig in further. If what they have discovered could be the oldest civilization known to man with ancient technologies such as flying machines and nuclear weapons, I knew that there had to be something going on here. This just started to smell like something fishy, kind of like a cover-up. And so as my search for the truth got stronger, I couldn't hold myself back anymore. And that's when I decided to book my flight pack my bags, and fly out to Dwarka myself to see what's going on and why the excavations and exploration stopped. After three planes, two car rides, and 35 hours later, I arrived to discover as much as I could about this lost city. Over the last four years, I've been researching this city that's been submerged underwater. And this city could be one of the oldest civilizations known to man. They've found some walls and they've found some stuff that carbon dates 32,000 years ago. Now, when I was younger, my mom used to read me, you know, scriptures from the Bhagavad Gita and tell me about Krishna um, and, you know, I didn't know when I was younger growing up, I just I thought he was a god, or maybe he was something else, we don't know. You know, the, the scriptures say he came from another planet, which is just altogether a whole different story. And then we have, you know, the people in the southern tip of India who say he was just a regular man, but either way it doesn't matter. He was a leader and he was a hero to many, and that's what's most intriguing to me, that thousands of years ago there was someone who fought these wars and these celestial wars, which basically means in the scriptures it says that he would fight in the air with chariots, flying chariots, almost like flying saucers. And that was pretty interesting to me, so I started researching it more and more, and so that's why I came to Dwarka, which literally means door or gateway.
They started excavating this area around here in the 1960s, and they continued it until the 1990s, and then they put a full stop on it. They say that they found two cities twice the size of Manhattan off the coast, but this area was actually where um, they lived for a long time. No one really understands why they put a full stop on it. I mean, it could literally prove to be the oldest civilization known to man. So I decided to actually come out here and figure it out for myself. Tomorrow, we're actually gonna go to the island where the indigenous tribe still lives, where they found some of these artifacts from the Harappan Age, which was, you know, 1500 BC, 2000 BC. And they found a lot of evidence that society existed there exactly around the time of when Krishna was alive, which means that all the stories and everything could actually be proven to be true. This was originally one of the biggest ports uh, in India, you know, thousands of years ago. And it was used to trade and, you know, the spice route and everything was like right along this river here. And so if you look here, this is the main entrance. The river is actually right behind here and they would come from the river and go straight up uh, into the temple over here. So can you tell me a little bit history about the temple? Uh, this is the main temple of Dwarkadis, and it has a 5,000 years old history. One of, one of the four holiest places in India is, is this temple. They did some excavations here, as you can see some of the rocks here uh, behind me. And they found some really cool stuff here, like, you know, shells and stone anchors and even some old coins that were used um, for trading a long time ago, you know, thousands of years ago. Some of these rocks here, and you can see all the different shells in here that are stuck in here. And this is all like sandstone that's been compressed over time. So it's pretty cool uh, exploring this area and, and seeing all these different kinds of stones and, and some of the stuff that they've excavated over the last uh, 20 to 30 years and then mysteriously stopped. Stop, stop, stop. The history of mankind is so unknown and that's the reason why I'm doing this because I want the history of man to be actually known. I want the truth to be revealed, right? Everyone's always in search of the truth. Where do we come from? How do we exist? And what are we doing here? You know, my goal in life is to figure that out. So that's why I'm here. And my wife and I started a nonprofit, and the nonprofit foundation is actually going to be for things like this, discovering the uh, origin of humanity. And not just in India and in Dwarka, but around the world too. As I continue down this journey, I want you to join me because I truly believe there is a link from the ancient to our future. What we are seeing around us is very real, and the things we are just starting to discover are starting to all point to the fact that there was at one point a much more advanced civilization that existed before us. What secrets do they know about the world that we don't? How were they able to build such precise structures, understand technology, and travel across universes? And most of all, who are we? Well, tomorrow I'm headed off to an island where a lot of the excavations were done and where I can find more information on the previous explorations done here. I'm excited and I can't wait to see what I discover. So here we are, I'm on the island of Bit Dwarka. You can see that we took a boat here and on the other side is the, the mainland. And this is the island where they found the remains from 1500 BC. 
And in the ocean over here, um, there used, this used to all actually be land. Everything that you see water here, and it was all submerged out all the way into the, the sea over there and into the sea over there, all submerged where they, where they actually did the underwater excavations. So here, we're actually gonna go to a couple of temples here and go to a couple of the excavation points. We're gonna go and explore, and it's absolutely amazing here. The energy here is absolutely just vibrant. So you see a lot of these uh, women around me and the men around me that are wearing this, they actually have tattoos all around their arms and their necks. And those are the indigenous tribe of this area and also on the mainland that we just came from. And so those um, people, they actually only speak one language and that's called Gujarati. And they don't speak English, they don't speak Hindi, which is the national language, nothing. It's absolutely ridiculous, but these are very popular here. So we're gonna jump in the back and we're gonna go to another temple right here on the island. So let's go. So we're here at the other temple and what they're doing here is everyone is lined up and eating uh, the offering that they've given to uh, God. So this is a common mode of transportation here. <laughs> we gotta hold on to these three-wheel motorcycle taxis. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this other area and off the coast, off this temple that we're gonna go to is where they've done the excavations in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. So we're gonna go check out some of that area. So this is uh, one of the areas where some of the stuff you can see just kind of washes up on shore. So what, what I've seen here is you have random stuff like this, these round circle stones and some of this stuff, it has inscriptions on it. You can see some of this stuff was, was washed up from shore and out there was a lot of, a lot of the land um, that was submerged and you can actually see the whole entire coast. This is one big island that kind of just wraps around. There's another one back there too. And the funny part is everyone from this island doesn't know where to go to find this kind of stuff. You just have to kind of go out on your own and, and find it. We've asked about five, six people. Everyone's just like, we don't know, we don't know. Found some other things as well. Looks like this is pieces of a wall. It's all kind of just broken and coming onto shore. And I'm sure there's tons and tons of other stuff that we can, we can go along the coast and just find. But we actually have to go out and go diving. But the government of India actually banned all of that stuff and put a stop on all of it, which is pretty interesting. The artifacts I found in Dwarka were not just fiction. And I wasn't just finding this stuff randomly. I knew I had to go deeper. Why? Because there's an ancient text called the Mahabharata describing a beautiful city called Dwarka. This ancient text also mentions that Dwarka was built by Krishna and was eventually devoured by the sea, making it a lost underwater kingdom. And so here I was in that exact city, that exact lost kingdom, looking for more information, but no one could help me? Well, the Mahabharata is one of the major Sanskrit epics of ancient India and is actually the longest one as well. There have been many attempts to unravel its history and compositional layers. It is a very complex text consisting of 18 books. These books describe a war between the Pandavas, led by Krishna, and the evil Kauravas, in which 4 million soldiers are said to have died in 18 days. Now, did Krishna really exist during this time? Could such a war have taken place so long ago? Was Dwarka a real city where this war took place? Well, prior to coming on this trip, I discovered that the most significant supporting evidence of this war, evidence of Dwarka, evidence of ancient technology, and evidence of Krishna's existence 
actually came from astronomical references which were discovered by Dr. Narahari Achar, a professor of physics at the University of Memphis, who is the world's foremost researcher of the astronomical events described in the ancient texts. Traditionally, Indians have believed that the war took place about 3000 BC, but modern scholars who have a more critical approach to the study of the epics take a different view. Professor Achar said that there are many types of astrological events referred to in these ancient texts consisting of eclipses and comets and conjunctions of planets with different stars. The most intriguing part of these astrological events is the appearance of two fiery comets. Professor Achar identified in the Mahabharata that there were two comets with blazing coppery red heads. These two comets were mentioned in not just one book, but two of the books of the Mahabharata, namely the Udyoga and the Bhishma Parvas. In conjunction with these comets, he noted that the texts also mention that Saturn was at Aldebaran and that Mars performed a retrograde motion near Antares. Professor Achar then used several different pieces of astronomy software to determine the date in the Mahabharata and the existence of Dwarka. These pieces of software enabled him to view the night sky as if it would have appeared any time in the past and so he painstakingly reproduced the exact night sky for every single reference in the Mahabharata. A lunar eclipse occurred in the month of Kartika and took place at Pallades, which is located in the constellation of Taurus. After this occurs, the Mahabharata mentions that it is followed by a solar eclipse near Antares. Dr. Achar took this evidence and searched for the years 3500 BC to about 500 AD and found there are 137 such conjunctions where Saturn is at Aldebaran. When we see Saturn's transit at Aldebaran, it's usually an event which is even today considered by Indian astrologers to be associated with great wars and violent events. One recent event where the transit of Saturn at Aldebaran was in 2001, the year that the Twin Towers fell. Saturn's retrogression eerily predicted the exact month too, September. Dr. Achar then searched for years in which Mars performed a retrograde motion near Antares. It turns out that this reduces the dates from 137 to just 17. After narrowing this down to just 17 dates, he looked for years where there was a lunar eclipse in the month of Kartika, and this reduced the set from 17 to just 2. These two years identified by Professor Achar were 2183 BC and 3067 BC. One last final piece of conclusive evidence solved this puzzle. In 2183 BC, the winter solstice occurred in the waning phase of the moon. In 3067 BC, it occurred in the waxing phase, and the waxing phase is exactly what was written in the Mahabharata and what Dr. Achar was looking for. A careful study of these ancient scriptures yields data about a third eclipse in October of 3067 BC, which follows the solar eclipse at an interval of 13 days, exactly how the epic describes it. The evidence presented by Professor Achar overwhelmingly pinpoints 3067 BC as the year when the great battle described in the ancient texts of the Mahabharata took place. Because the astronomical dates and the events described in the Mahabharata have been authenticated by modern scientific method, it is reasonable to conclude that the Mahabharata itself is a factual description of events that took place during that time. As I dug in more, I found references to Dwarka and references to flying machines or what are commonly referred to as Vimanas in the ancient text. I discovered there are 41 places in the Mahabharata where they mention Vimanas. Of the 41 mentions of these flying machines, there is one particular interest that deserves special attention, in which there was an air attack by King Salva on Krishna's capital of Dwarka. 
It was written that King Salva had an aerial flying machine known as a Soba Pura, in which he came to attack Dwarka. Details of this can be found in the ancient Sanskrit text called the Bhagavata Purana. In the Bhagavat Purana, which is sometimes called the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a description of a vimana made of metal that was used by the king Shalva to attack the city of Dwarka, which was Lord Krishna's city. There's still a city of that name in the Gujarat state of India in northwestern India. In ancient times, it was the capital of Lord Krishna, who was, you could say, the head of the forces of good in the universe. This King Shalva was opposed to Lord Krishna, and he wanted a weapon that he could use to attack the city of Dwarka. Delighted with his new wonderful and powerful airship, the wicked King Salva gathers his army and heads for the city of Dwarka to battle with Krishna. From his excellent Vimana, he threw down a torrent of projectiles. A fierce vortex arose and blanketed the entire area with billowing dust. Then Lord Krishna suddenly appears in his shining chariot to confront King Salva in battle. When Salva saw Krishna's chariot on the battlefield, he thereupon released a great and powerful weapon which flew through the sky with a roaring sound like a great meteor. The text describes it as being so bright that it literally lit up the night sky. Now this sounds a lot like a blazing rocket, and as Krishna began his counterattack, Salva engages the special powers of his Vimana in an all-out effort to avoid destruction. He began to shower missiles from the sky. Krishna at last threw a powerful ground-to-air weapon which hit the plane in the middle and broke it into pieces. The damaged flying machine fell into the seas of Dwarka. This Vimana was used to attack the city of Dwarka. In the end, Lord Krishna shot it down and it crashed into the ocean off the coast of Dwarka. So that's an example of a Vimana made of metal. And it had a very unusual flight pattern. It said it could appear several places at once and then come together in one form again. So it appears to have had uh, an ability that modern militaries are developing, the ability to fool uh, the defense uh, forces of, of, of a country into thinking that there are many different attacking aircraft when in fact there's only one, and this will confuse, say, the radar detection systems. So yesterday I went over to the island of Bit Dwarka and Everyone there, all the locals, all the tribes, everyone just said, we don't really know, uh, you know anything about the excavations or where to find any of the information, and there's not much on the internet. So it was a bit of a disappointment yesterday. Although I got a lead from someone, one person over there on the island said, go to the mainland and go to the ASI office, which is the Archaeological Survey of India. Now, this organization was one of the lead government agencies that helped drive the initial exploration and expedition and excavations that were going on in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so all we had was a last name and a general location. So after about 20 minutes of walking or so, we actually found this guy and we found the location of where he was. This man is actually very interesting. He told me that a lot of the stuff that was originally done here is not located here anymore. We actually have to go to a place that's 10 hours away and I'm actually taking a car there tomorrow, six o'clock in the morning, sitting in the car for 10 hours, and I'm going to the main office in Vadodara. The man at ASI also said that uh, S.R. Rao, S.R. Rao is the original man who led the excavations here in the 80s and he discovered tons of stuff, brought all this stuff to the press, wrote books about it, and you know, he said that this is the lost kingdom. This is the lost kingdom of you know, Lord Krishna. He was saying that, that he was a real person. This is proof that you know, the stories that we hear about this, this man or this god or whatever you want to call it, this hero, is actually true. 
ASI, um, I asked the guy, I said, why did everything stop? You know, if this is true, why wouldn't you excavate more and get as much information as you can? If you found stuff that predates 5,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, even some things that were 30,000 years ago, why wouldn't you want to investigate more? And he says, everyone just quit. So this, this was interesting to me, and so I asked him, was it a budget issue? And he says, no, there's plenty of money for this project. Everyone just quit. No one had any more interest in it because there wasn't any interest for it. And here's something even more interesting. The man that took over after SRL mysteriously disappeared, he went, vanished as well. Now, how can two people and a whole team of like 30 people just go away and this whole project comes to a halt? So I said, hmm, this is getting even more interesting. Did he find something that they don't want to tell people. Is there some kind of cover-up here? Is there some kind of conspiracy? What actually happened? So here I am in Vadodara. It took about 10 hours to get here, long journey. And so today, in the morning, um, I went over to ASI, which is the head office that I, I was told to come to. So after going to the office, it um, took about an hour before the guy actually saw me. Uh, turns out he's a really, really nice guy. And so I'm actually gonna go see him tomorrow and I have another meeting with him. I'm gonna start like actually pry information out of him about the whole exploration and why it stopped and where this man disappeared to and what's actually going on over there. On March 26th, the day after my 11 hour journey by car, I met with Dr. K.C. Noriel, the superintending archeologist and director of the Archeological Survey of India. He was a bit standoffish at first, but then I explained to him that I'm doing this for nonprofit and I wanted to interview him to help spread the knowledge that the world needs to know. Dr. Nariel sort of lit up when I said that, and he brought up two other excavation points that he wants me to be involved in. It was cool stuff, but still evading the subject at hand. I asked if he could go on camera for an interview today regarding the submerged kingdom and civilization of Dwarka, and he said that he had to go to a meeting, and we could talk tomorrow after he gets his papers together. So I scheduled a meeting with him for tomorrow at 1 p.m. After Dr. Nariel told me that he needed to get his stuff together, I left and went to go look for someone else to get more information. I was tired of getting the runaround. That's when I looked up a local university that was involved in the excavations, and I found a school called MS University. At the local university, I went around asking for the head of the archaeology and the ancient history department. The archaeology and the ancient history department helped out with the excavations in the past, so I figured they would be perfect to answer some of my questions. After about 30 minutes of roaming the university, I finally found the office. Dr. K. Krishnan was his name, and he was the head of the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History. I was told by his assistant that he was at a meeting. She also told me which meeting he went to, and this wasn't just any meeting. He was at the same meeting as Dr. Noriel, the guy who I just met with at ASI. Whoa! Now this was starting to get weird. These two guys were in the same meeting? Well, I can't wait for my appointment tomorrow with Dr. Noriel. This is going to be epic. So I am here in the state of Gujarat, a city called Vadodara, and I am here at the Archaeological Survey of India, or ASI for short. I've set up a meeting here with Dr. Noriel, and he is um, a doctor in archaeology and has been studying uh, India for quite some time, especially the state of Gujarat. The history of Dwarka was known as the uh, ancient city of Lord Krishna. You know, there's a lot of controversy as well around whether it was actually the city of Lord Krishna or not. So from archaeological perspective, uh there is no doubt that Dwarka was a city and once upon a time a, a very flourishing city which was enjoying uh, Arab-India trade. Uh, but uh, to relate them uh, with uh, a particular city of a particular time period is, uh, is a moot point and uh, right now debatable point. And uh, their argument uh, sound convincing, yes this was once upon a time uh, a, a flourishing uh, a port city on the west coast of India. Okay. Any particular reason why they stopped the excavation or 
what is the reason? No, if, I if, think if, no, if, no, no, no. Um, Whenever we undertake any excursion project, we have uh, set goals, aims and objectives. But if you find, if we had found something from so long ago, then why not find more? That, <laughs> uh, is it funding mostly? No, 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 we don't have any problem of funds. But as I just said that uh, we have academic goals, academic questions, research questions. So once we have realized uh, we don't see any point in going further unless more uh, uh, research questions are framed and uh, then we uh, plan to uh, find, a, find answers to them. Okay. Um, one more question. In the ancient scriptures they talk about um, using vimanas. Vimanas. Vimanas, okay. yeah. yes. Um, which are basically saying flying chariots. You see, one can build up n number of theories, but then the uh, uh, the central uh, issue is uh, how to substantiate that. What yeah. are the conclusive proof uh, yeah. to to support that? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, as far as I understand, maybe a, a, a fig of uh, imagination. After I left the ASI office, I cruised on over to the Archaeology and Ancient History Department at the local university where I was looking for the same guy I went looking for yesterday. I walked over to the university and finally found Dr. Krishnan at the Ancient History Department. It was an amazing meeting. He mentioned to me that he did not want to be on camera because he didn't want to be the one known to give this away or to talk about this. He said that the government put a stop to the excavations because of politics, but he believes that if the people from outside of India push for it, they will reopen the excavations and the research. He actually put together a whole entire presentation that he was supposed to present in front of the government about the underwater kingdom, but then the government never got back to him. He is a true believer in having the truth revealed, and he said that he would help me in any way possible. He was totally on my side to discover this ancient civilization submerged underwater. He actually asked me to push forward on my mission. He really believes there's something in the submerged city and civilization, and there's tons of proof. But he doesn't know exactly what they found, and he doesn't have much access to it. When I left, I started to think about what had just happened. So the first guy I met, Dr. Noriel, at ASI was somewhat helpful. He avoided the subject on the lost city of Dwarka, but I got some information. He said the politicians and the government stopped the excavations. He didn't say why, but he did say that they put a stop to it. He also said that without proper scientific evidence, he doesn't know if this underwater kingdom had ancient technology, but he also didn't deny it. After I met Dr. Noriel, I met the professor Dr. Krishnan. They are both in the same town and went to the same meetings. But one told me that there was ancient technology, beings, and civilizations from thousands of years ago, and the other told me there was no proof of anything. Sanskrit scholars and other non-Hindu intellectuals tend to look at such tales as if they were nothing more than highly imaginative mythology with no basis in fact. No doubt over time such stories have been embellished with religious overtones, but the often highly technological details embedded in some of these early texts remain difficult to explain. What's more are these certain objects, such as the ones I have found on shore. These were obviously man-made and carbon datable. They were also found in the 90s by Alok Tripathi. This and other discoveries by NIOT using C14 dating established an age of 7,500 years ago for the various artifacts excavated from the submerged site. Dr. Richard Thompson of Cornell University in 1993 is one of the few scholars who have given the subject a look. He wonders, if this is mythology, how did these authors of ancient India so brilliantly describe rocketry, ray weapons, and flying machines and highly sophisticated aircraft? 
And with the recent discovery of underwater ruins and astrological proof that Dwarka actually existed, academians should be asking themselves questions like, can we be so certain that there is not a core event behind this startling account? Rather than cast this subject aside as unworthy of our credibility, shouldn't we be regarding this account as deserving our interest in academic scrutiny? If we also take into account the archaeological evidence, the astronomical references, and all that has been handed down by the Indian oral and living traditions, we are led to the inevitable conclusion that Krishna, Dwarka, and ancient technology did actually exist around 3000 BC. And this is why I found it hard to believe that only a handful of people in Dwarka actually knew about what I was searching for. So, the next steps will be to do more research and create more awareness on Dwarka, to push the government to let us do more underwater excavations because now I have no doubt that there is something there. On my 36 hour journey home, I started digesting everything that had happened to me over the last week. I started wondering why I even went on this trip in the first place. I realized that it all happened for divine reasons. Something was meant to be and something was meant to happen out of all this. It was almost like it was one big cover up. And only when I interviewed Dr. K. Krishnan from the university did I actually get some help. I then started wondering how many other places are like this around the world. There are lots of places around the world with ancient history, and Dwarka is only the tip of the iceberg. What knowledge do these places contain that we need? What can we find out about from our past that can be used in our future? We have places around the world like Machu Picchu, Egypt, Stonehenge, Atlantis, places in Mexico, and even in the United States. There are so many places like this that need our help. They need our help because we need a group of us to go in and free the information around these places that are being kept secret or have closed down shop. It's these places around the world that are the key to our future. What did the ancients know that we didn't? How could they build so many advanced buildings and know about astrology down to the finest point? What kind of technology did they have that we still can't replicate today? These are the questions that we at Ancient Explorers will attempt to uncover the answers to. These ancient and deeply profound questions and the search for the truth is what drives me and is what drives us as explorers. We at Ancient Explorers have a six step path. One, travel to ancient sites around the world. Two, explore these sites in search of evidence of ancient technology, wisdom or hidden treasures. Three, establish a sustainable community around the ancient sites for the locals. Four, document the process and create educational tools to help the world solve the mysteries in these ancient sites. Five, support the movement with an online community of explorers and seekers who wish to join the mission. And six, to use all the funding for the development of the project and put any profits towards the cultivation of nonprofits around the globe. If you're ready to join Ancient Explorers today and become a member, register to become a community member to help this movement. Inside the community, you'll find tons of interviews, videos, and documentaries like the one you just saw.